everybody. This is Alyssa Chiu. I am the founder and CEO of Anchor Taiwan, a platform focusing on ecosystem building and venture capital for cross-border innovation. It is with tremendous pleasure and honor to gather so many of you from around the world to talk about the future of mobility. This is a topic that has always interested us. One inspiration for this particular session is the newly defined intersection between brands and manufacturers, startups, and corporates. During a keynote se session a few months ago, Gita Fisker, co-founder and CFO of Fisker, talked about their asset-like business model. She said, quote, we don't want to build our factories. We want to partner with the best of the best, like Megna International, like Foscom. They know supply chains, they know volumes, they know processes, unquote. This truly shows the new paradigm shift in the auto industry. Can supply chain be more than supply chain? That's the question I would like us to ponder. While the biggest manufacturer in the world, Foxconn, is expanding from phones into cars with their MIH open platform, we're also seeing more players from the supply chain entering the game through corporate venturing and corporate innovation. For example, last year, EV startup Canoon went public. Did you notice that among their spec investors, there were TPK and Yajiro from Taiwan? You might or might not have heard of them, but increasingly, players from around the world in the supply chain can be your strategic partners and investors. Of course, if you know where to find such opportunities. I am extremely grateful to bring the speakers and interviewer together for the session today. They come from two segments at the center stage of what I mentioned earlier. One from the East, one from the West, one from a tech manufacturing giant, one from the EV startup world. However, there's probably no easy way to define them black and white as they are both so international and dynamic. As usual, our interviewer is an industry veteran himself. Through the preparation of this session, I truly witness how a world-class leader and innovator work together. For us at Anchor Taiwan, we don't host events for the sake of hosting events. We host and curate events because we believe that an event is the beginning of a conversation, an inspiration, or a connection leading into so much more actionable collaborations. I hope you will walk away with at least one new contact or idea from today's session for many more beautiful things to come. This series would not have been possible without our co-host and important partner, DG Times. Before we start, I would like to invite Eric Huang, Vice President at DG Times, to share a few insights on today's topic. Eric, over to you. Thank you, Alisa. Greetings, everyone. Alisa, Vitali, Monica, and Jack. Glad to have all of you join the webinar. I'm Eric Huang. The Vice President of DigiTimes. I'm responsible for DigiTimes Asia and lead our research team to provide supply chain insight with an angle from Asia. Before the panel, I would like to share two interesting figures. This month, the EU proposed an effective ban on the sale of new fossil fuel cars from 2035. You may know year 2020 was the first year that Europe surpassed China as the biggest EV market in the world with a sales volume of 1 million and 365,000 versus China's 1 million and 246,000. If this policy become low, it will accelerate the adoption of EVs. We all know that the government policy is the biggest driving force for the EV market growth. Based on our forecast by year 2025, EVs will take over 20% market share of the global automotive market. And the compound growth rate from 2020 to 2025 will exceed 40%. In this figure, you can see with the booming of the EV market, dozens of EV stops try aggressively to commercialize their design and penetrate the market. They are in different geographical regions and in different market segments and have raised nearly 20 billion US dollars from investors. The status of these EV newcomers varies. Some successfully gain the footing and begin to challenge the established giants. For example, 
China's Li, Otto, Xiaopeng, and Neo all shipped around 8,000 EVs in July. Some stops have successfully secured funding and are ready to enter the market, like our panelist, Monica's company, QEV Technologies. Some failed, like Nicola, and some are facing challenges, like Lucy, which just restructured the management team and reshaped their business strategy this year. There's another paradigm shift of the automotive industry from product development point of view. The car is under transition from software hardware integration system to software hardware separation and software defined, and from proprietary system to open platform. We can see the emerging trend of the adoption of autom automotive OS and EV skateboard platform. The figure shows the EV platforms developed by automakers tier ones and stops. With the advantage of economical scale and economical scope, automakers can speed up the EV design cycle for different segments and models. Many strategic partnerships form within the ecosystem. For example, Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi Alliance co developed the CNF EV platform and four adopt Volkswagen's and EB Playphone. While automakers Playphone mainly dedicate to their own camp, Tier 1's EB Playphone will have a stronger spillover effect for EV newcomers to enter the market with less capital investment. Such as Porsche and Megana have their own EV Playphones. Just like EV, many EV newcomers whose management team and shareholders come from tech industry. We can see some EV platforms are developed by technology firms, such as MIH platform, which is backed by Foscon, the world's largest tech EMS supplier. Glad to have Jack Jen, the CEO of MIH Alliance, to join the panel today. In conclusion, technology is disrupting the automotive industry. It's not just the technology itself, but also the newcomer from tech industry to enter the market with creative thinking and a fast speed. No one can tell who will win the EV battle, but the one thing is for sure, the automotive ecosystem will be significantly transformed in the coming years. Now it's over to you, Alisa. Thank you, Eric. And I'm seeing a lot of great messages and greetings in the chat. Keep them coming and feel free to also paste your LinkedIn um, URL. Remember your goal, at least one new contact or idea before the end of today's session. And if you were in our last Asia Venturing session, which by the way is available through recording, you know that our interviewers and moderators are all industry experts and keynote speakers themselves. I first met our interviewer today, Vitaly Golom, in 2017 in San Francisco. He was already a serial entrepreneur, an author, a founding partner at HP Tech Ventures, among other things. He is currently leading M&A and IPO transactions as a partner at Drake Start Partners, focusing on mobility and energy transition. His clients include Rymec, Fisker, Hyperloop, and many others. Vitaly, so great to have you here with us and so happy to end up working with you after so many years. How are you today and where are you dialing in from? Thanks, Elisa, I really appreciate it. I'm uh, dialing in from Los Angeles. I'm usually in San Francisco Bay Area, but in LA this week. Fantastic, so Sage is yours. I'm gonna let you introduce our speakers. Have fun. Thank you very much for the invitation to host this great event. I've been a big fan of Taiwan for a very long time. In fact, so much so that both my kids are half Taiwanese. Um, I'm an investment banker with over 20 years of experience on all sides of the table. Throughout my career, I've been involved in dozens of financing, joint ventures, and M&A transactions across North America, Europe, and Asia. And today, I lead the global mobility and energy transition practice at Drake Star Partners. We are a multiple award-winning global tech investment bank, which is uh, in its relatively short history has completed over 400 transactions, 70% of which are cross-border. Our team of 120 plus bankers is spread across 10 offices in US, Europe, Middle East, and Asia. And I got to know our first panelist by helping Remats Automobili raise its first major round of funding. Coincidentally, it was led by the largest automobile battery manufacturer in China, well before Porsche and later Hyundai got, uh, got invested in the company as well. So Monica Mikatz is a member of the founding team at Remats Automobili, the maker of the all-electric and fastest production car in the world in the Vera. 
Recently, it was announced that Rimas will take control of the 112-year-old French hypercar brand Bugatti. There, as the chief operating officer, she helped grow the company from eight crazy kids in a Croatian garage to hundreds of employees and a very respected place in the global automotive industry. Today, Monica is the chief business officer of QEV Technologies, one of the companies that helped launch Formula E electric racing, developed many vehicles from major OEMs, and is electrifying bus transportation across developing countries. We also have Jack Cheng. He, he is a pioneer in the automotive industry for many, uh, especially on this call. He doesn't need an introduction, but I'll do one anyway. Uh, he spent over 19 years at Ford, where he became vice president of his China operations and then served as the chairman and CEO of Magneti Morelli Asia Pacific and then chairman of Fiat and Fiat Finance China. He left to co-found NEO and then XPT, the provider of advanced technology components and the solutions which are the brain, heart, and soul of NEO vehicles. In September of 2018, NEO began trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Today, it has a market cap of $74 billion. In January of this year, Foxconn was able to convince Jack to come back to Taiwan to head up its MIH Alliance, an open EV ecosystem that promotes collaboration in the mobility industry. So with that, welcome Monica and Jack, and we'll jump right in. I'd like to ask you both, how did you get started in the automotive industry? Maybe Monica first. So my journey in the automotive industry started uh, back in 2010 uh, when I met Mata Rimac and he was just a crazy kid, you know, who wanted to develop the world's fastest electric supercar. Um, I worked before uh, as a journalist, actually, and didn't know anything about the automotive industry. But I really liked his idea and I liked his spirit. So I decided to join the team. And basically all of us were, you know, jumping without a parachute and trying to build it on our way. Uh, and company, uh, of course, had uh, ups and downs, but at the end developed in the big automotive player. Um, at the moment when I realized, you know, okay, Porsche came in, a uh, company is just going to get bigger. It was time for me for new challenges. And that's when I joined QEV to become a chief business officer. So now it's been uh, more than 10 years in the automotive industry for me. And Jack, I, I gave a quick intro, but uh, you, you have a tremendous history. How did you get interested in the, in the industry in the first place? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vitaly. Um, Hi, good morning and good evening, everybody around the world. Um, uh, I have an honor to be here with you guys. Um, firstly, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I was a veteran of the automotive since the uh, 1980s. Uh, so, so we have uh, a lot to do with uh, also a passion for the uh, mobility world. So since 1980s, I was with Ford, and then uh, after uh, several decades, I had been uh, retired from four and I joined Fiat Chrysler under the introduction of uh, uh, Sergio Marchioni, who is the FCA's uh, chairman um, before. I have a pleasure to work with a lot of people in the world, around the world. So uh, I still have my mobility uh, passion to go forward. So in uh, just five, six years ago, I founded the NEO together with my partner. Uh, we had a lot to talk about in the EV world. So that's, I think, the paper of today. And also, I was lucky enough uh, last year, I would get invited by Foxconn to be back in Taiwan to, my, to be my hometown. So I really have that kind of a sensation and also passion to move this new mobility world together with you guys. So it's nice to be here with you. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. So why don't we uh, pick it up where, where you just left it off. Uh, what, is, what attracted you and inspired you to come back to Taiwan to step into the CEO role of the MIH Alliance? Well, firstly, uh, Vitaly, it's, it's all about uh, coming back home uh, where you see Taiwan is a beautiful island. As you know, you have two kids also from Taiwan. Uh, we love this island and we want to put our passion into it particular in the, uh, the new generation. How do we inspire the new generation to be more mobility oriented? Um, there's a lot of people now uh, 
under this new situation of the worldwide pandemic, then they need to mobilize themselves. And I do believe with our EV concept and also our open platform concept, we can get a lot of talent to be able to jump into it and develop together with us to create a better world for our next generation. So that's all about coming back home. Not a bad thing to do. Uh, Monica, you're now Chief Business Officer at QEV. Uh, it's not a title that every company has. Uh, what does a Chief Business Officer do on a daily basis? And considering your business is very global, how do you find a common language with all of your global customers and partners? So in every startup, um, I would say that even if you hold a certain role, you need to wear many different hats. So, of course, in QEV te Technologies, uh, we are 130 people uh, for the automotive industry. That's really a startup. And uh, I need to do whatever is necessary for the company to succeed. But as a chief business officer, my main role is um, to coordinate with existing shareholders, uh, to do all of the fundraising and all of the relationship with investors, and also to do all of the business development for the company. And as you mentioned, uh, I frequently work on different continents uh, from our clients and partners in Asia to our clients and partners in America. So I had to learn uh, beside, you know, working late hours or early morning hours or in the middle of the night, like I'm doing right now. Um, I had to also balance different cultures learn a lot of different customs, um, adapt to that. And I always like to say that you actually work with people, not with companies. So that's my um, uh, key, uh, key mission, you know, to think in my head and always trying to, to balance and learn uh, how to work with the different cultures. Uh, and uh, definitely it would help out uh, if I know Chinese. I think that uh, would make me a billionaire probably. <laughs> but I didn't start to learn it at the proper age. So it's really hard for me. <laughs> Very good. I'll, I'll let you borrow my, my daughter. She's fluent and, um, and she can be a translator. And, and I know you're going to teach your daughter probably uh, Mandarin as well. Definitely. <laughs> So, um, so, we, so the automotive industry went through a couple of shocks in the last uh, year and a half or so. First, the pandemic shut down the automotive industry completely. And, um, and now we're getting some side effects of that. And we experience disruptive supply chains, delays in various important components. What will it take for us to get back on track and recover as an industry? Jack, maybe, maybe you first. Sure, sure. I, I think that uh, uh, the whole pandemic hit is really happening for the last uh, almost two years now. Uh, we are experiencing a lot of issue, particularly we are all locked down at home. So there's no, not too much of a mobility activity that you can do. So I would believe that uh, to recover from a new angle, if we are moving uh, the so-called the lockdown uh, environment into the car. Isn't it the better approach that uh, people can be actually counting the quarantine time as part of their 14 days or 21 days? Uh, when they are tired of being locked down for seven days, they can go into their car and then give it a drive. Um, you know, it's still being counted as a part of your uh, uh, quarantine period. That, isn't that wonderful? So I, I, I believe there's a lot of things that we can do after the pandemic to make the mobility world more livable or even more uh, agile for people who are interested in doing this, uh, particularly in the digital health period. Uh, you go into the car, you get uh, your, your heartbeat, your pressure and everything from the sensor, and then you make that environment as part of your uh, digital health environment. So I think there's a lot of things that we can do and then we can recover from that angle. What about that, uh, you think, uh, Monica? Uh, I completely agree with you. Uh, and I also think that uh, 
we are not going to recover in a sense that we are going to come back to the same as it was before. So definitely we are going to experience a lot of different changes and we all have to adapt for what is waiting for us because uh, most of the time we were expecting, you know, this is going to pass in a couple of months, this is going to pass, but uh, it will last much longer than we are expecting and we need to learn uh, how to live uh, with a new situation, how to work online, how to have conferences online. Um, and as you said, uh, maybe even having conferences in the future in our vehicles, in our cars. So reshaping totally. Now, one possible positive effect of the pandemic uh, related manufacturing shutdowns has been a big jump in EV market share because as all the supply chains are coming back, they're certainly not going to be building for the past. And EV is uh, electric vehicles are very much obvious and no brainer now. Now, are we finally at the tipping point of electric vehicles? How do we get uh, beyond just the 5% of sales? That seems like a big jump up to this point, but we have a long ways to go. What needs to happen? Well, uh, let me go first. Uh, if this is uh, uh, early stage of the EV scale up, mainly because it's driven by the regulation and also incentive at the moment. Um, you know, there's a new announcement that uh, from US side also to get the EV going. Um, but uh, I firmly believe once you have the EV experience, uh, you're not going back to the combustion engine. And that's, uh, it's a different world because uh, uh, not only from the environmental point of view, but also from the user experience point of view, there's a lot of things that you can really touch and feel. And then EV, if it become a smart EV, a smart mobility, then it's a totally different world. So I think that the experience that can get all the uh, customer is a one way street. They never come back to the combustion. So that's something that I think uh, uh, if you ask me whether there's a hockey stick point that I wouldn't say uh, a exact year, but at least three, four years time when the combustion engines, the fuel consumption, uh, and also the operating cost is really um, more than the uh, EV, then there will be a tipping point there. I also Monica, think it's, it's actually, uh, I think it's really a, a perfect moment uh, for the shift to happen because uh, people were not spending too much. People were not moving and people really want to buy new cars, uh, move forward. And it's a right moment to give it a push for electric vehicles. Um, considering Croatia, where I'm coming from, uh, it's a small country and uh, the car sales dropped heavily in 2020. Basically, you know, nobody was selling cars because nobody was moving anywhere and nobody thought about buying car. And uh, now in 2021 beginning, uh, government uh, gave 14 million euros of subsidies for electric cars in two days. Uh, people applied and got, you know, all of the sub subsidies that were possible to buy cars. So in, in basically two days, you had uh, higher car sales and electric car sales than you had it in the 2020. Uh, so I think that this is really a moment where all of the uh, players in the EV industry should use it and should push people to buy electric cars because people want to try new cars, people want to go to some events, people want to have different experiences and people want to spend money that was um, waiting on the side and you know they, they couldn't go anywhere and couldn't spend. Now, there, there have been two factors that have driven statistically uh, EV adoption more than anything up to this point. One is government regulations, the other is government incentives. Uh, what programs have you seen uh, that have been effective and what would you like to see more of? And how much of an impact will the U.S. infrastructure bill make, do you think, in the U.S.? Well, five years ago, when we just started from China, there were, uh, uh, you know, just a start with the uh, incentive. And also the regulation is now moving toward uh, uh, supporting the EV, but it's uh, on a gradual basis. But uh, for now, uh, if you just see what Joe Biden's uh, announcement 
on the uh, uh, incentivizing all the EV industry to go forward with $174 billion of a bill. That's something uh, huge because now the big uh, conglomerates are competing uh, from China and US, now in Europe, everybody is trying to do something differently. So I believe that um, from that sense that uh, we have a chance to uh, move forward because there's a lot of things that uh, all the, uh, the, the regulation do is just uh, a sparkling all this. And later on, the consumer was gonna do something about, you know, with all this incentive, incentive they will be moving to uh, user experience, user interface, and also gaining that experience and creating the pie bigger. And once that pie is bigger, you know, we, I, when I was in the automotive industry, I, we always say product, product, product is something that drive the whole, the whole uh, requirement. So I believe that there's a lot of things that we can do to make sure that uh, the increase of the EV and then spread into the whole bunch of a smart mobility world. For me, the perfect example how to do it is actually Norway. Uh, and uh, if you look at the Norway in 2020, EV sales of light vehicles uh, was 54%. Uh, while in U.S. that number was only 2%. So there is a huge difference for the U.S. to catch up with all of the efforts that, for example, Norway was doing. And in Norway, uh, at the moment, you could say that EVs are already mainstream. And I think they've really combined well um, all of the regulations, having in mind that uh, until 2025, uh, they want all of the cars uh, that are going to be sold to be either electric or hydrogen uh, and also all of the incentives they have. So basically their tax system allows you, you know, um, if you're going to buy uh, some really, um, um, some basic Ferrari, uh, it would probably be so expensive that even if you're buying uh, electric hypercar, that would be cheaper for you than buying some regular Ferrari. Uh, and also this tax system uh, makes it really easy calculation for you. Uh, the e-golf, it's going to be cheaper than the regular golf for you. So I think those are the, the things that all of the governments should look, um, basically do the, the copy paste of what Norway is doing and push people for it. Yeah, it's really about bringing that cost of battery uh, to under $100 per kilowatt hour and getting the cost of the EVs below uh, below the cost of the internal combustion vehicles. And then, of course, uh, the government doing their part with incentives uh, to, to, to push the scales of the economic scales a little bit before that. Now, um, Monica, QV has chosen to focus its efforts in large part on electric buses. Talk about the market in developing and developed countries and the impact electric public transportation will make. So for us, uh, all of the technology that we were developing in the racing segment uh, and in R&D for other clients, um, we wanted to use it for something that has much more impact. And the impact that we saw is in a public transportation. Um, and we definitely noticed uh, that in emerging markets, um, nobody's really paying attention what is happening and a lot of pollution is actually happening over there. So we started the project in Philippines in 2017 um, because there are 300,000 of jeepneys, uh, small minibuses driving in Philippines that are polluting heavily. Uh, for most of the people, this is the main way of transportation in Philippines. And government didn't have a solution what to do and how to transfer all of those buses to electric. And if uh, they would buy um, completely new buses, it would be really expensive. And also all of the jeepney manufacturers in Philippines, um, they would shut down. So that was not definitely a solution. And here is where we came in. And we offer the solution of electric kit uh, that can be used for conversion of those jeepneys. 
At the end, project developed a bit further and we actually developed the full, full platform for those uh, mini buses. Uh, and even, you know, offering to our clients if they want the, the full bus to be produced and delivered to them. At the end, that was a showcase of a business model that could be actually copied in many other countries. So we started something similar in Peru, uh, well, where we also delivered platforms and then the local bus manufacturer is building body and interiors on top. Uh, and selling those buses that are being produced locally. Although the tech part and the platform part is coming from QE. And uh, we even noticed that, uh, although we didn't consider at the beginning, for example, Europe as our market, but at the end we noticed there is really a need for similar product uh, from European companies or some Western companies. Uh, for example, we are discussing some of the projects for conversion of school buses in US. Um, so there is really a, a huge need for those kind of solutions that were not existing on the market. And this is where we want to push. So not offering the full bus, uh, but also keeping, you know, um, companies that are producing buses and offering them the technology where they can build. And I think this is something similar what uh, MIH is doing with a platform for uh, cars. And um, uh, basically, maybe they, there could be opportunities to work in the future uh, for the bus platforms. <laughs> It's a, it's a very good segue. Thanks, Monica. So, so Jack, the MIH Alliance plans to become the Android of EVs, as you said before, and use Foxconn's manufacturing capabilities to help establish uh, established and vehicle startups electrify. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the economic model and the supply chain efficiencies behind that um, that will make this a better option than doing manufacturing in-house, much like Foxconn has done with electronics at large? Okay. Thank you, Vitaly. And thank you, Monica for mentioning MIH to give me a good start. Um, MIH itself stands for uh, mobility in harmony. And a lot of people say, well, you can make it like make it happen. Yeah, Foscon is the company backing up uh, big time that we're doing uh, an open platform, meaning that you have a platform of MIH that is also offering to uh, the developer to do something like Android uh, on the system of the phone and you actually do it on the EV, you can really also look at the Costco uh, model, you know, the, the, the marketing of doing a lot of things and you put it on a platform and people can put their uh, services and developing uh, into uh, something like, you know, a, uh, a platform that you can offer to all different uh, user experience, uh, particular in the MIH for the last seven, eight months, when we started this, this journey, we have uh, uh, collect almost 1800 of partners. They are interested in doing with our current structure, the working group and also technical committee that we bring everybody together and, and creating a, a module and solution rather than just a component business. So we bring them to the end customer, the brand, and we can offer different configuration. If you are asking for contract manufacturing, we can offering only a uh, hundred uh, percent ready EV for you. And you just put the nomenclature on, or you do 80%, you can leave the uh, digital copies to yourself. We do everything underneath and we offer it to you uh, with also the body, the, all the specification you require. Or the least, but not the, uh, the, the last, not the least is the uh, skateboard. If you only want a skateboard and you want to produce for your uh, national pride, you want to put your body on, you want to do everything. We can also uh, just provide you with the skateboard. So different configuration and bringing the different partner be able to develop something that is really connect to the user, particularly on the software side to define the hardware. That uh, is something that MIH is now promoting. Uh, with that, I think we get a lot of talents now because it's an open platform. 
we becoming an android of the EV rather than other player. Everybody's closing their loop. They do it themselves and spend mega money on the development cost. Eventually it will bring the barrier a lot higher. Uh, we're providing a lower barrier uh, entrance. So anybody, including the tech company, they can become a manufacturer or the, the provider of the EV for their brands. So th this is a new concept. I think everybody is trying to think whether we have a chance to become the android of the EV. And I do believe this is going to be a vision that we can accomplish. Very good. Well, let's let's talk about the exciting world of racing. Uh, racing has always been very important to the automotive industry. There's a saying called race on Sunday, sell on Monday. Uh, now for EV and this, this whole new world, it offers uh, yet a new way to do R&D. Uh, Monica, maybe you can start talk a little bit about um, how exactly R&D gets transferred from racing into other vehicles and why is it particularly important for EV racing um, or EV right now? We always like to say from race to road, uh, racing has always been part of a DNA of QEV. And uh, I would say that we are actually at the moment leader when it comes to electric racing. We are actually involved in all of the electric racing series that exist at the moment. Uh, in some of those electric racing series, we are just, uh, you know, acting as a support team for development of new technologies. And in some of those like uh, uh, ERX uh, Rallycross Championship, we are producing all of the cars and organizing the whole championship. And uh, we consider that racing, especially with electric cars, so when you consider, for example, Formula E. In the Formula E, um, you have all of the same bodies, uh, but teams are able to change certain parts of technology for every season. And this really allows to all of the manufacturers that join to develop new technologies that could easily be applied then later on in the cars that go to road. And for us, this was really a, a platform to develop new technologies that at the end are applied even in the mass market products like buses. Maybe you would say it doesn't make sense. You know, you're developing something that is high performance, but with engineers that are um, working uh, with crazy deadlines uh, have to be creative, especially, for example, with us, we were always a team that has had like smallest budget. So we had to figure out, we had to be really creative. And this is, I think, where the best ideas are coming from that can really be applied in the mass market products. And Jack, you were also involved uh, through NEO's Formula E team. You were also involved in racing um, about the same time that QEV was. So what experiences do you, did you take from that? I was surprised, uh, Vitaly. I was told by Monica. He, she was there in Beijing for the first uh, racing. Uh, and I was there to uh, just promote our uh, Neo Formula E team. At that time, we called ourselves Next EV. Uh, the Next EV team actually uh, hired, uh, you know, Nelson Piquet Jr. as our first champion uh, championship winner. So we set our goal uh, Everything uh, we started with the brand, we need to be in the racing, uh, just like Ferrari, right? So you got Neo in the uh, first year, our goal is to get the championship of the racing. We got that. And then the second year we go with the supercar, which is the EP9. Uh, we have this 1,000 kilowatt, which is about 1,360 a, a horsepower of animal that uh, driving on the racing track uh, and then gain a lot of attention. So actually we launched that in 2016 in, in London and it was a success. And 2017 would be our first EV, uh, EV and then 2018 we go to the IPO as you mentioned. So we set the goal very clearly and it's all about building the brand, including the IPO. You expose yourself and you make sure that everybody's understand where you're coming from the racing track to the reality of the mobility world. Everything went through the severe uh, environment were becoming more available and also applicable to the real world situation. So I think we still have that passion and not only about the rock and roll, okay? It's, it's about you have 
really something you love and you like, and you can turn that into reality. And I need to point out one thing. Uh, at uh, the first season of the Formula E, uh, the Next TV team, uh, the, the team principal was Adrian Campos, uh, our partner, and actually also our CEO, John Orus, was behind uh, running it. So we are really proud that uh, Next TV, later on Neo, won the first season championship with Nelson Piquet. Yeah. See, when we talk about all this, we all get excited, right? Uh, Vitaly, so I think yeah, you should totally. talk about this more. And in particular, we have all this uh, uh, celebrity and all everybody, the young boys are coming, young girls, uh, everybody dancing. So it's a different world. Yeah, we'll see if, if uh, Formula E takes over Formula One at some point yeah. in, the, in the near future. Oh, yeah. Well, we um, there, there has always been a bit of a tug of war between established com car companies and the EVs. It was us versus them. Now the tables have turned and, and the situation has changed. Um, what kind of a role can established industry stakeholders play in the transition? And how can they support these companies? What, what type of investments should they be thinking about and making uh, the big corporates and looking to the future now that EV is inevitable? Maybe, Jack, uh, you can start on your side. Okay, um, I think that there's a lot of uh, movement that we believe that uh, the traditional guy are also doing. They're embracing the new, uh, new company. They even acquired the new company. Some uh, new company guys are also moving forwards with cooperation with the uh, you know, mainstream OEM. So uh, the investment coming into it is really uh, huge right now. Um, I believe that uh, also the technology giant, um, you name it in California where you stay right now, Vitaly, uh, everybody is moving toward uh, making sure that they are part of this uh, uh, autonomous drive world or even mobility world. Um, and then and it's all about also how do you get the chips available? As you mentioned just before, the supply chain issue of the chips really how do you make your brand, uh, you know, uh, is available to drive this future mobility? And I believe that the, uh, the investment will be threefold. One is in the software, uh, second in the electrical uh, architecture, and then the last but not the least is the chips. So these investment will come in big time and then bring everybody together rather than you know, OEM are competing with the new startup and then trying to kill each other. It's a bigger pie now we're creating. I think everybody can be part of it. And then the three area that I mentioned, it would be a worthwhile investment. Very good. Monica, I completely agree. Thoughts? I completely agree with you. And I think we will see more and more uh, mergers happening with big players and uh, new startups coming on the scene. Um, it will be even, I think, mergers uh, between OEMs and some tech companies that are not strictly related to the automotive segment, uh, since a lot of, uh, all of the new vehicles are going to be uh, connected uh, and we will experience this uh, connectivity, user experience that will become really important. Uh, cars are not going to be just cars. They are going to be also like our phones right now. So uh, due to that, I think that more and more mergers are going to happen between uh, small startup companies and big OEMs. Very good. I wanted to um, remind our audience to post your questions. Uh, we're going to get to the Q&A uh, part very soon as we're wrapping up our prepared remarks here. Uh, so please do post and we will we'll be coming to that section shortly. Now, uh, here's a fun question. Uh, who do you think will be the biggest car makers, let's say in 10 years? Do you think it's gonna be the established brands that we know or some of the recent or uh, startups or even the companies that we've never heard of before that haven't been founded yet? What do you think, Jack? Well, 20 years ago, you never heard about Tesla, right? And now they are the biggest in valuation, uh, even though the volume is not big enough, 
So who knows another 10 or 20 years, who's gonna be the biggest one. Uh, but I wouldn't say uh, a, a, a one that uh, without anything that being merged or as what Monica said, people are trying to, uh, trying to be joint venture together. Um, I, I have that experience uh, in the automotive for 40 years. It's been always changing, but there are names that are never fading away. So I, I, I think that uh, if you want to do a new animals, uh, like, you know, what we had just uh, seen is like the big company will be supported by different continents, uh, Europe, US, China, each continent will probably have one or two and becoming the, the leading uh, sheep. And then uh, there's a lot of uh, new startup also gonna, this is uh, a new world. Everybody is gonna create new stuff. Uh, it would be very exciting. Absolutely. Monica, your thoughts? I really believe that um, we are going to experience probably, you know, some of the startups uh, uh, taking the lead, but also uh, big OEMs, um, you have smart management over there. They're going to adapt and they are already adapting. Uh, it is also um, a change that is going to happen, not, not with electric cars itself, but with autonomy that we are experiencing with the mobility and the way how we use the cars. So I really consider that uh, maybe you're going to have some of the um, old OEMs not adapting properly and not surviving, but I think most of them will survive. And in a way with a merger or joint venture with somebody, they're going to succeed and reshape their business models. And also this was a really good opportunity because um, you would not have startups in the automotive industry if there was no start in the electric vehicles because electric vehicles allowed everybody to start from the ground zero. And that's why all of the uh, newcomers in the automotive industry were possible at this moment in the history. Three. Very good. Now, speaking of autonomy, it seems to be finally somewhere over the horizon. And how do you think car ownership and transportation will change in general? And how long do you think the transition will take to true autonomy? It's uh, hard to say, uh, Vitaly, but um, people are saying five years, people are saying three years, uh, seven or seven years. But uh, it's going to come uh, within this decade. Uh, I believe that uh, because of um, this new mobility world, uh, people will try to uh, leverage the, the share, share riding and also um, to be able to use that as a convenience for their day-to-day uh, -day work. But in the ownership of the car, uh, people are also seeing in the weekend, they want to go out, they want to have their own mobility transportation rather than riding on a Uber or Didi. Um, so there's a lot of things that uh, I think the, uh, uh, the ADAS would do to the uh, new mobility world. Uh, but if you ask me the specific years, I don't uh, have that number, but uh, if you ask me whether it's going to come in, definitely it's coming. Just like five, six years ago, I know EV is coming and people say, are you crazy? Are you, is this, is this not going to work? But hey, it's here. So it's going to happen. So we're going to make it happen. I think Monica, autonomy think? is, I think autonomy will um, happen gradually. Uh, probably it will first happen that, you know, you have closed cities, uh, city centers, and then, you know, you have only autonomous cars driving over there. Um, I believe that to, to really experience this full autonomy and uh, seeing it happening in many different areas of the world, we will need at least 10 years. Um, I'm not really optimistic that it, it can happen in a shorter time, uh, but those are just predictions. And I really believe that polarization is going to happen. With the young generation, you see that um, 
a lot of people don't want to uh, even get the driving license. Uh, it's not fun for them. Of course, you're always going to have people that love driving, that enjoy it. And even with the young generations, you have people that are passionate about racing and passionate about cars. So I believe that people will want to have cars. Probably, you know, um, more or less the cars that you want to drive are going to be some kind of sports cars or some kind of cars that you really enjoy, some historic cars. So they're always going to be fans of driving. And uh, for the most of the people, autonomous is going to be solution. Um, I, I look at from my perspective, um, I like driving, but I don't like to stand uh, in, in, you know, a crowd and, you know, you're, you're uh, driving like uh, two kilometers per hour and then stopping on the stoplight. So for that, I prefer to be in an autonomous car and read a book, answer my emails. But uh, uh, for Sunday and driving, I, I don't know, in, around the hills in Croatia or on Croatian seaside, I would prefer to do it in my own car. That's why I say on Saturday, you're going to still own the car. And then on the weekday, Monday through Friday, you will enjoy the DD or Uber. Much like horses, uh, cars will become uh, something just for leisure. Manual yeah. cars, or I, I guess we'll call them non-autonomous cars. Yeah. Uh, horses is autonomous if you train them right, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, I want to do a quick lightning round. Um, I have a few quick topics that I would love your, your responses to. Uh, very short, you know, uh, how long you think it's going to take and how important you think it is. Um, so we'll start. So maybe go Jack, Monica. So um, starting with Jack, solid state batteries. All right. You, you hit the right stuff. Oh, it's coming in the next two, three years. <laughs> and and how important like is it? <laughs> oh, it's so important. You got to hit uh, uh, one charge if you're going to go uh, 800 kilometers of mileage. You got to have solid state. <laughs> Monica, your thoughts? So definitely solid, but I'm also not sure, you know, will maybe uh, graphene be a uh, next big thing. So I think that we are going to experience uh, not maybe in the nearest future, but in the next 10 years, we are going to experience uh, some more improvements in the battery segment. And uh, beside the solid state, maybe it will be graphene or maybe something else. Okay, fast charging. Fast charging uh, is good to have, uh, but uh, most of the people now, if they can get a cup of coffee and then get it all down, fantastic. If not, put it at home, you don't drive over 100 kilometers. 80% of people don't drive over 100 kilometers per day. Uh, so, well, nice to have. I think with fast charging, we are almost already there um, for, you know, what we need the fast charging to, to drink a coffee and charge your car, it's here. So, great uh, opportunity, but as Jack said, you can charge your car at home. Okay, uh, and is battery swap even relevant? A relevant idea anymore? Jack? You're talking about my baby, uh, Vitali. Uh, I know. Battery swap. <laughs> uh, we learned from the Better Place uh, story before. Uh, battery swap uh, help uh, you new know, sell more car. It's a unique selling point, and then also it's people buying it is not just because of convenience of uh, within three minutes you can swap the battery. It's wow! It's so cool. And people go there and then experience that uh, merchandising model. And also, you also can uh, sell the, the electricity back to uh, the swapper. So you actually, if you are 80% charger, when you drive over there, you can sell the 50% of your capacity to uh, you know, the swap station and gain the credit points. So this is cool. Uh, and I think that's uh, something that you can s help selling more car. Monica? I think it is a cool point from the marketing perspective, but I'm not sure with the improvement in the battery cells, um, will it be so attractive in the future? I think uh, GoGo Row is the only one that's done it at scale, really, up to this yeah. point. Yeah. Now... Yeah. Um, Hydrogen. 
it's hard to build a hydrogen uh, station. Uh, it's a huge investment. You need government uh, huge support. And uh, um, compared to the BEV, um, if hydrogen operating cost is competitive, that's going to come in as a parallel competitor to the uh, pure electrical. But uh, at the moment, I didn't see it flying yet. Marco? In my opinion, hydrogen is future for big trucks, heavy duty machines. And uh, for those kind of applications, we are at the moment developing hydrogen platforms. Uh, and it will be much easier because you don't have to provide, you know, charging infrastructure on many different places. So since it's really for a specific niche, uh, I think it's going to work. Yeah, very good. Now, related to that, um, maybe air taxis, uh, the electric VTOLs. Wow, you're going to fly, right? So... It's good to have a taxi, but uh, there's more space up there, so you can uh, try to allocate uh, the mobility world. But uh, depends on regulation whether we are open sky. Monica, in my opinion, there is a, a long way to go there. Um, a lot of different regulation changes, um, also a lot of improvements on the technology side, especially in the battery segment. So uh, this is not something that is so close. Uh, true autonomy, when and how important? <laughs> Started from your uh, garage parking. And uh, uh, if you think that's a true autonomy, I think you can get it down pretty quickly in two, three years. If you have all the big data of the garage space of the world, you, make it, you manage it, you go there and you drop your car at the entrance and it park itself. But if you are going to take, talk about true autonomy globally, everywhere in the world, huge, huge complexity. Uh, you see, as I said, maybe within the decade, we can see some uh, light in the tunnel. Um, it's gonna take a lot of complexity and challenges. Absolutely, Monica? I agree completely. 10 years at least to see it on larger scale. Uh, and importance, I think probably the most important because it's going to reshape the whole industry completely. So you're saying I'm still going to have to uh, give my daughter a keys to a car to drive? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, very good. So I have one last question from, from myself. Uh, when we come back together in five years for our reunion talk of this one, um, Jack, what will be your job? Oh, I'll be enjoying every moment that uh, I'm still doing this uh, so-called mobility job. Every five years, you see I'm doing something new. And I want to enjoy every moment that I have with the new generation. I think there's a lot of things that we can explore and help inspiring the next. So... Uh, Another mobility job, uh, but it's going to be the same thing, helping the next generation. Very nice. Monica? So my goal is to really make a difference and uh, change life of many people, uh, like, for example, what we are doing right now in Philippines. Um, I learned quite early, if you want to grow, uh, you need to uh, not only learn, but really change yourself and I'm ready to change myself. Uh, so maybe at this moment, I cannot tell you exactly the role that I'm going to hold in five years, uh, but I'm definitely going to pursue my goals. Very nice. So with that, I'm going to switch over to questions from our audience, and I will start one uh, to Jack. We saw that Foxconn recently announced a mobility fund with one of the major financing holding companies. Is it a plan uh, for Foxconn to invest in the mobility space? Well, I think that uh, is a great question that um, the MIH uh, consortium is actually forming the working group and we are trying to build uh, a solution for the EV world. Um, with this working group, I think they will be creating some unicorn uh, for sure and we would uh, ask also this fund to invest on those unicorns to get them grow. 
So it's like an incubation uh, and make sure that uh, we have the new startup available, diamond in the rough, we pick it up and then we grow them. And, and is, can you talk about the business model? There's another question of MIH. Is it nonprofit, for-profit? And what's Foxconn's role uh, going forward in it? Well, the, the consortium is a nonprofit. We were trying to organize this working group and also technical committee and make sure that people uh, gather their best talent, developers, and doing something with the new IP. And that IP will be then the share uh, we're asking uh, our founding member at Foxconn or whoever the new OEM, they are interested in coming into it as and go to market of, uh, capacity. So with that, I think our new technology, when we develop as a solution, we will provide it to uh, the Foxconn of the world or the new founding member of the world and make sure they have the marketplace they can play with. Very good. Now, Monica, question for you. Um, can you share a bit of advice for startups trying to secure partnerships and funding from big corporations? It was very impressive what you built with Porsche, Camel, and such. How did you do it? I'm sure it's a fast answer. <laughs> there is no easy answer on that one. Uh, I, I remember when we started and the first show that we had was Frankfurt Motor Show. And uh, we presented this fastest electric supercar from Croatia. And we had uh, engineers coming from Audi, you know, and they were really calculating, is this really possible? What those guys are saying, 1,000 and something horsepower supercar, electric supercar from Croatia. Um, and uh, it, it was really hard. Uh, when you're starting to approach those big guys, uh, it's uh, extremely hard. Uh, it, also, the barriers to enter the automotive industries are high. You need a lot of financing and you need the people that are going to trust that the product that you're making is something really uh, a breakthrough. So, um, in my opinion, it, the most important is to create a product that you can show. Uh, because with the product is much easier. So finding like small financing to create a showcase and to, to really have something to present. And then a lot of networking, a lot of knocking on the doors uh, to really be able to, to even pitch your idea and present what you're doing to, to big guys. Now, Jason asks, um, maybe Jack, back to you. Um, when can we expect a real breakthrough in battery tech? Well, there's always a breakthrough every year, as you say, that um, uh, there's a the energy density increase and trying to hit the road, uh, you know, with the new technology. And I, I think that as we talk about the solid state and all the uh, graphite uh, technology, there's, I think every two, three years, there's a, a upgrade. So uh, that's a, a generic answer to that, but specifically what year, what day, what kind of technology, I don't have that right now. Got it. Monica, any thoughts on that? Somebody who comes with a breakthrough, it's going to be an ex Bill Gates. So this is going to be something revolutionary. And honestly, I'm following, uh, as Jack said, uh, every year you have something new, uh, some new companies coming, coming out, but nothing was at the point to really be on a mass market level and to really be able to produce in larger volumes. Okay, Monica, uh, you mentioned this before. Uh, this question comes from Robert, Robert Brown. Uh, Norway is often used as an example of successful mode of electrification, but the U.S. is not Norway. For countries which have a fragmented, uh, po fragmented political views, uh, different views on electrification and climate change, and enormous connections to the fossil fuel industry, um, what can EV companies do to leapfrog the slow pace of change and, um, and drive organic motivation in the market to switch to electrification? I think they need to have more people trying the car. Um, I, I know that from the fact that, for example, when we started in Remac with electric hypercar, um, it was really tough. It was tough to sell the car because a lot of people were, am I going to buy a supercar that doesn't have sound? Um, and when they sit in the car, when they experience a torque vectoring, when they experience acceleration, 
uh, they are so um, overwhelmed with uh, um, different inputs from the car than they are used to that they really forget about this, like, okay, uh, I'm missing the sound. They don't miss the sound. They like the experience. It's something new. Uh, it's something exciting. And I think that's really important for all of the players that are producing electric vehicles. More and more people need to try them because when they try electric cars, they love it. Uh, all of the electric cars that have this acceleration that is much better than any gas-powered car that you have. So this is the key um, if we are not taking account of the government policies. Well, the best way to do the test drive uh, is to do the sales of uh, EV is do the test drive. As a, every three test drive, you get one customer. That's amazing. That's much better than, than typical. Now, uh, Jack, for you, a question from Daniel. He's formerly from GoGo -Go Row. Um, I think he asked a question that uh, it has some insight. How do you ensure good integration between the MIH skateboard platform and customer vehicles? Okay. Um, the skateboard itself is easier, uh, simpler, and is very clean. And, and by the way, it's open. So we have no black box. Uh, we open up to the developers and then uh, the developers will put everything on it. And also the corporation will be becoming uh, so transparent. So you don't block with all this development costs hiding in behind. Everybody can try their best and then uh, get the best uh, cost structure and also the qualities uh, elements of it. So, so I think that's a, a very, very open question and also is an open answer. Got it. Monica, one for you. Um, you are an international advisor for EV Dynamics. Can you share a bit more about your experience working with Asian corporates? Any particular big plans coming up in Asia? Um, definitely, EV Dynamics is planning to completely internationalize they, their business. Before, companies was mostly focused on selling buses uh, in Chinese market. And now the goal is to really spread around the world. Um, also, there is a, a cooperation with QEV Technologies uh, and uh, EV Dynamics is actually our manufacturing partner for all of the platforms that we are producing around the world. Um, and uh, I consider that companies uh, from Asia that are internationalizing their business model and changing a bit uh, are going to have a huge impact uh, in the future. Uh, James is asking, uh, James from Penn Engineering is asking how companies, um, I'll, I'll try to generalize the question, how companies can get uh, to be part of the MIH supply chain ecosystem? Well, join the uh, uh, MIH uh, member. And then uh, when you registered, we were started to evaluate and see whether you can be qualified in a working group. And also if you are a contribution uh, member, that means you will be actively participating in all the technical discussion. Uh, we'll make it part of the family. And then we, sh we want to also make sure we can create a solution for the, the end customer. And a question from Jesse, uh, maybe for both of you, um, with, with all the uh, global pressures and the political changes, do you think that EV supply chains are going to get more localized and, and kind of reverse from the uh, global supply chain that we've seen in the past couple of decades? Monica, you want to go first? I think that's... Uh be really hard to, to localize, uh, uh, especially when it comes to, for example, uh, battery cell production. Uh, do you really think, think that, you know, uh, battery cells are going to be produced uh, locally in different countries? Um, I don't see that happening. Uh, so in general, I would say at least for the key components, we would not experience localization of the product. Well, I would uh, uh, think a hub and spoke kind of approach will be happening with the hub that you got the R&D, the development, and also the key component will be centralized. And then 
with the arm to the hub uh, that every spoke, uh, if you are creating in US or in China or in Europe for those things, then you put it assembled together and proximity to your customer. So uh, I think still there are ways of restructuring the supply chain, particularly when the battery and also for the motor and, and then and so on and so on. Um, definitely chips is another thing. You won't be able to provide the chips manufacturing everywhere in the world. You need a central hub to do the chips and then you supply to the uh, different locations. Now, uh, somewhat related to that, um, there is some consolidation in the IC market over the last few years. Do you have fear that somebody manages to quarter the automotive IC market and there'll be more problems like we experienced today with, uh, with uh, chips? Well, the, today's uh, problem is more with the, uh, the mainstream chips rather than the high-tech, the 5 Nymo or 7 Nymo. Um, there are uh, evolution to the new world of mobility. And I think there will be capacity built for the world in the next two, three years. And then we'll make sure that we're ready for, because we have more visibility now for the future world. Uh, now we can really build the capacity around the world and make sure that we don't have the same issue as of today. Monica, any thoughts on that? Agree completely. Now, um, there are other opportunities besides hardware. This is a question from Venkat. I'm going to try to paraphrase it um, and generalize it for you. Uh, what are the other opportunities besides uh, building hardware? You know, is, are there opportunities in building software components, or new sensors, uh, new lighting, you know, different components that can be in, an interesting business in, in being a supplier in, in the new world of EVs? Definitely. This is... Um, the new technology is going to be all becoming how to work together. Just like after pandemic, people know if country and country, they don't work together, you don't have a chance to fight with those virus. Uh, so if you're working together, like the lighting and sensor com component supplier uh, becoming a partner, and then you can really provide a smart corner rather than just lighting or sensor as is the light with the sensor in the corner, and then we call it smart corner, and make sure we have the total solution, a 360 degree visibility of the vehicle, and then make sure the technology are taking care of our visual and also our touch and feel. So these are the things that I think there are uh, a lot of uh, working together to be done. And I would point out that uh, software is definitely the key when it comes to electric vehicles. Uh, maybe even more important than the hardware itself. Very good. Now, uh, Jack, probably to you, uh, Jules asks, EV and smart mobility in Taiwan, how far off are we? Who is going to be leading this? And what is it going to look like? What will be the benefits? Uh, leading what? Uh, leaving the industry? Leading the industry of smart mobility in Taiwan. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think that... Uh, uh, I can't, I can't say anybody, but I think we are moving uh, in a fast way that we, we want the speed to happen. And so as we told you that uh, uh, we established MIH just for the last seven, eight months and it's becoming huge. Uh, we want not only for Taiwan, we want to do it for the world. So started from Taiwan, embrace the world, and make sure that we have the continents are all buying into it, an open platform, forming a new Android of the EV, and make sure everybody is jumping into it and develop it for it. We want to get the world's talents to do that. Everybody can uh, do that, and particularly with the software work from home, we can get all the talent working on those things for the EV world. Now, uh, Joanne asks, um, do you think that the acceptance of EVs is already there uh, from, uh, from consumers? Is there anything else that the car companies can do to create more motivation <laughs> considering that they're still more expensive than internal combustion cars? Monica, you want to do that? I think we already answered partially. So what companies can do are test rides, a lot of them. 
Uh, and uh, I consider that more and more people really want electric cars. Now it's just a question how many can afford at this point those electric cars. Yeah, that's agreed. affordability. Yeah. I think Elon Musk said once uh, when he was talking about demand for Model 3 that um, just people physically don't have the money in their in their wallets to and they want the cars, but they they don't they couldn't afford them. Um, now uh, automotive companies like Tesla, like Neo, have been leading the charge on charging. And uh, do you think we're getting to a point? This is a question from Peter uh, from Ypro. Uh, are we getting to a point where the market conditions are right for energy companies to take the lead in building the infrastructure now? Well, I think we're in the, uh, the early stage of get, engaging the, the grid, uh, the power grids. And uh, uh, we started to have the concept of doing the solar city for uh, different countries. So um, the industry leaders, uh, particular um, with the charging and also the, uh, the national grid uh, corporation, uh, we will be able to do an energy storage company or energy, energy storage system for a different country and make sure we leverage the best green energy uh, and with the big data and make it a splash. That's, that's also very good for the next generation because we will see a lot of carbon index being identified and then make sure that everybody contribute to it. And I would like to point out that um, um, companies uh, that are, you know, producing electricity, they are sometimes the one to push uh, for electric mobility. So we have a case uh, in Peru uh, where a company uh, that is main supplier for the electricity was actually the one to first push for uh, two electric buses being produced with our platforms uh, in the local, com local bus company. Um, because they see that they need to build the charging infrastructure in the future, and they need to make also this push to electric vehicles. Yeah. Very good. Now, um, here's a couple of fun questions as we're nearing the end here. Uh, do you think that Tesla will be uh, the EV company with the highest market cap five years from now? If not, who and what type of company will it be? Jack? <laughs> you, are, you are saying that it's a fun question. I think it's a serious question that everybody wants to be on the top. But uh, now, who knows? Uh, Tesla is on the top of variation. In five years' time, it could be even higher because if their volume hit uh, 10 million, I guess how huge it's going to be. But uh, nobody's going to be taking the whole pie. Uh, we are actually competing each other and we are creating more uh, visibility of the world that can do the EV. I believe that uh, there will be two, three new uh, conglomerate more to come uh, and competing with Tesla. If I knew the answer, uh, I would probably uh, be trading stocks, uh, uh, not working in the automotive industry. It's <laughs> <laughs> my job. But I agree uh, with you. I agree with you, Jack. Uh, I think there will be more companies on the top, not only Tesla. Yeah. Now, last question, and it's a great way I think to wrap up um, to both of you. If you were to have a follow-up call after this, uh, what would be a great starting point to have some actionable collaboration next? Jack? Well, if we have a follow-up call, we want you to join the MIH and then be part of the family. Let's do something together and make it happen. That's it. I agree completely. So I think that we can be a client for MIH because uh, we are constantly looking for platforms for our clients who want to develop, for example, electric SUVs, but there is too high investment to develop platform on their own. Uh, and on another side, uh, maybe we could potentially collaborate with the uh, electric bus platforms that we are developing. And for the future, MIH uh, could supply even uh, uh, bus platforms, not only uh, platforms for cars. You got it. 
<laughs> Excellent. I think I think there's at least one deal that's going to come from this event. Uh, well, I think I want to thank you both very very much, uh, Jack, for your early morning in Taiwan, Monica, for your late late night in Croatia. I was supposed to be in Ukraine this week already, so it would have been in the same time zone. But luckily, I'm in in LA. Um, so thank you very much for your, for both of your time and insights and your energy. And um, Elisa, back to you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, thank you, Vitaly and Jack and Monica. It's really a great pleasure and honor, as I mentioned earlier. And thank you so much for joining us. And thank everyone in the Zoom with us from the very beginning as well. I know that we have a lot of industry experts from all over the world. And judging from the questions that um, you know were asked during the Q and A session, this is really. I'm gonna watch the replay already. I know that you know, like there are probably a lot more insights that I can get from this. And I wish we had more time to talk about racing. And rock and roll, and a lot of these exciting trends. I'm sure, hopefully, there will be more conversations to come for that. But I guess this is,、um, you know, like basically toward the end of our session. However, remember that you know this is a series, and basically every month we're gonna bring something new to you. And remember, I mentioned in the beginning that a lot of Asian players might be important partners for you for your further expansion. Next month, we're going to explore the traditional sector. Do you know what they're doing to innovate? Say,、so、for example, in the、um, bike manufacturing sector, in the textile sector, in agriculture, and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of them are looking for partners externally to innovate and to add technology. You might be the partners that they are looking for. You might even be the investment target that you they are looking for. But obviously. You will need to know where to look for such opportunities. Scan the QR code if you want to RSVP for our next session, or check out our social media channels for further information. And with that, again, I want to bring Jack, Monica, and Vitali all on stage. Thank you so much, really,、uh, for working together on this cross-border basis with us throughout the last、uh, couple of months. I really appreciate your time and effort, and also hope. That this is really just the beginning of a lot more collaborations to come, and with that, I'm going to end the session. Greetings from Taipei one last time. We hope to see you again very, very soon. Have a nice one. Bye bye. Yee.